Well, it's that time of year again, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. I'm getting my hair cut today. No! Get one last look at these long, luscious, flowing locks at this kind of half mullet I have going on back here because it's all going away. You'll never get a chance to see it. Although, actually, that's not true. I did film a Dr. Stone video yesterday that I have to finish up. It's not out yet, uh, which is why uh, Senku's hanging out back here. And so I, I still had long hair when I filmed that video. But beyond that, say goodbye. Let's just make my hair as ridiculous as possible for today's video. Why not? Absolutely. You can tell I'm also approaching 30 because my hairline's beginning to recede. Don't think it won't happen to you because it probably <laughs> will. All right, anyway, um yeah, let's uh let's do a video about Izo though today. Izo has some fabulous hair. Let's just say that right out of the gate. All right, so Izo, 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 Izo. You know what is remarkable about Izo's character? Oda has not really focused on him for, like, an entire chapter. Like, you know how, like, he'll give, like, okay, this is, like, this character's chapter. We'll focus on this character mainly. Like, uh, Killer. When Killer fought against, uh, Hawkins, we had, like, the whole chapter kind of focused on him. When, like, Chopper developed the, uh, antivirus to the Ice Oni, we had, like, a chapter focused on him. And then, of course, we have, like, whole chapters focused on Sanji, Zoro, when they had their respective fights and everything. It's amazing. Izo has really not had a chapter dedicated to him. He's had chapters where he's, like, had moments. You know, like, in the last chapter, when Izo went up against Cypher Pole Zero, right? But, like, that wasn't the main focus of that chapter. You know, it was also, you know, Zoro meeting literally death. So that kind of took the show away. But even despite that... I actually am really feeling for Izo's character. It's like Oda has mastered the art of, like, Izo is sort of like a background character, but he appears enough to the point where you actually do feel for his burdens that he has to bear, and, like, the tragedy that has really befallen his life, and he's like, okay, Odin died, and he wasn't there for that, and then Whitebeard died at Marineford, and he couldn't do anything about that, and so, alongside Marco right now, they are back in action. The Whitebeard pirates are not an official pirate crew anymore they've been disbanded but they're like getting back together for like one last hurrah to like right the wrongs of the past so it's sort of like not just Izo, but like marco and Izo being present at wano together kind of really makes Izo's character more powerful i guess because it's like even though we don't focus on him that much he first appeared at marine ford and at marine ford he really was like a background character calling him a background character right now in wano is probably not fair but back in marine ford that's 100 percent fair because we had a bunch of whitebeard commanders that showed up and a lot of them we only saw in like a few scenes and things like that like we didn't really focus on haruta that much how about blenheim or curiel curiel is my favorite commander because he just uses guns. He just charges against Moria like, all right, bring it on, you weird onion human. Lock and load! And he just, like, unloads on Moria. So I love Curiel. Yeah, we didn't focus a lot on the uh, the commanders or anything. I mean, we see Izo, he's present, and then later on, Oda revealed the names of all the commanders and everything. And even later on than that, before Izo, you know, before we got the backstory involving Odin and the scabbards and everything, it was revealed that Izo was originally from Wano. So, you know, that's really cool. That really makes me think that, like, when Oda develops these background characters to start, he doesn't just throw them in there with no real basis. He has, like, sort of backstories intended for each of them. Like, probably not that much, but I can imagine when Oda was sitting down to design the Whitebeard commanders, like, obviously, like, Marco and Jozu Vista, they have more stuff going for them. But I imagine for every single commander... You know, Oda probably wrote at least a few sentences of their backstory. You know, like Rakuyo. Rakuyo was the dude. He was like the biker dude. I think he was the commander of the 7th Division. He had the mustache and the giant chain chomp thing that was like the sentient ball and chain, right? I mean, we don't really know anything about that dude other than the fact he was actually on Whitebeard's crew during the flashback 30 years ago. So maybe Oda put that in. Maybe Oda was like, this is Rakuyo. This is his weapon that he uses, and he's been on Whitebeard's crew for a very long time. And then I was like, oh, here's this character... Uh, Haruta, who wasn't on Whitebeard's crew for a long time, but this is his backstory, right? So, Oda does that kind of stuff. So, way back at Marineford, he might have wrote in, like, this is Izo, uh, he has connections to Wano, he was born there, so he's gonna be more relevant, uh, during the Wano arc. Um, I don't mean to say that Oda had planned out, like, every last detail of Izo's character, but, like, maybe keeps it open-ended for himself. Like, Izo's from Wano. Maybe he didn't plan that Izo was going to be Okiku's brother at that point. Maybe he did not plan that 
that Izo was going to show up and have a fight with Cypher Pole Zero during the Wano arc, but at least he sets that stuff up. He doesn't just throw random characters for the sake of random characters, okay? So... You know, we get the flashback with Odin, which was, once again, that was Odin's flashback. We focus a lot on Odin, Whitebeard, Roger's stories. We don't really focus on Izo all that much, right? There's the funny scene where Odin leaves the country. He jumps on the, trying to jump on the Moby Dick. You know, that's, that's a hard feat right there, right? So he tries to jump on the Moby Dick. He misses. He grabs the chain, right? He throws the chain at the, at the mast. And then Izo's just like, you're not getting away, Odin! And, like, jumps on his back, right? And so, you know, the whole whole story is that eventually Izo and Odin join Whitebeard's crew, and then eventually Odin leaves to go join Roger's crew for the one year, and then we don't see Izo really again after that, and then after that adventure... Odin returns to Wano, and Izo just decides to stay on Whitebeard's crew. So even though we do not focus on Izo, we at least understand that something must have happened in that time period while Izo and Odin were both part of the Whitebeard crew that Izo came to genuinely respect Whitebeard um, and call him, you know, a father, just like all the other members of the Whitebeard crew do, and decided to stay on board. And so that is actually prime flashback material for Izo right now. Now, if we're literally going to have, like, Izo's last stand in Wano, where we saw it in the last chapter, where he was grievously wounded from all the fights he's been in up until now, and he's never... I mean, he fought against Kaido, which, that was a pretty major fight. He took some damage there. But every other fight he's had ever since Kaido was pretty much just a bunch of, like, the underlings of the Beast Pirates, like the Waiters and the Pleasures, some Gifters and Headliners and stuff. Um, so they weren't, like, super, super powerful enemies, and Izo was able to take them all down, but it's more of just, like, you know, being awash with the number. He was taken down by that, okay? He was, like, just worn down through all the fights he's been in, right? And so he has this major wound on the side of his, uh, like, uh, his uh, chest or his stomach right now. It's bleeding pretty profusely. And so he lands, and then Cypher Pole is right there. Cypher Pole Zero. Not just Cypher Pole Zero, but the masked members of Cypher Pole Zero, which we've learned in the last few chapters you don't want to mess with, right? And so he had an out. He had a perfect out there where Cypher Pole was like, you know what? We're supposed to probably deal with you right now because you're a former member of Whitebeard's crew. We usually would not just let you leave, but we have enough shit going on on our plate right now. The whole castle is burning down, and we need to capture Nico Robin. So, you know, our, our objective is not with you right now. We're just going to let you go. So Izo had an out. He could have just walked in the other direction. Cypher Pole goes the other way, looking for Robin, looking for the Straw Hats, and Izo could have just went somewhere else to tend to his injuries. He still could have gotten back in the battle, too. He could have went to go tend his injuries and then jump right back into the battle to try to find Cypher Pole Zero, right? But no, he didn't do that. He has this look on his face of like, I would describe it as resignation. He's just, de he's decided to resign himself to his fate. He knows how badly injured he is. He knows that he probably doesn't have a chance against Cypher Pole Zero. So he's not going to try to like, I mean, he'll try his best, but he's like, he's not planning on defeating them, right? But he's just like, you know what? I've, uh, I've failed Odin. I was not there for Lord Odin when he died, you know, during the Hour of Legends when all of my comrades, all of the Scabbards and Conjuro, were on top of the, uh, the board, and they were suffering alongside Odin. I was not there for that. And then, when Pops died at Marineford, um, by Blackbeard's hand, there was nothing I could do. There was nothing any of us could do in that, in that moment, when Ace died as well. So it's like, Ace... Whitebeard and Odin have all died, and I was able to just, I just stood by as like a bystander, I wasn't even there. So, you know for a fact those deaths are running through Izo's mind right now, and he holds up his flintlock, and he's just like, I know what I have to do. Wait a second, Cypher Pole. And then he's just like points the gun, and then I'm, I'm assuming he's just gonna start blasting. He's just gonna start opening fire. And it would be so badass if he just takes out his gun and they're walking away, and then he just points the gun, he just fires, and he shoots one of them in the back of the head. And it's like they it doesn't kill them because they're Cypher Pole and they're like super powerful or whatever. They're like super endurance or whatever. And like shoot him in the back of the head. And then one of the members just kind of turns around and just glares at Izo. Maybe Izo blasts off part of their mask. Like that would be really cool. Like part of their mask gets blasted off.
and then you just see a scene with the cypher pole agent like the one with the bowler hat just turn to Izo and like half of his mask is blasted off by Izo's pistol because Izo's pistols and his marksmanship are not like standard he doesn't have a standard flintlock he can fire like those um those slicing rounds and stuff he used against Kaido so he has like special bullets maybe he can add hockey to them I don't know but he has like a special kind of like gunsmanship gunsmanship that's a term so he fires a shot blasts off part of the mask you just see a scene where the masked uh, member of CP0 looks over and you can see part of his actual eye now that his eye has been exposed by Izo's shot and it's just this eye of just like rage like it's like bloodshot and like veins are coming out of the eye and just like so you've chosen death then and both members of Cypher Pole just like speed blitz and just attack Izo and he takes out his other flintlock and he's just like all right, let's just do this. Bah, 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 bah. And it's this like it's like Matrix type shit. By the way, by the way, is the new Matrix movie out? Does anybody see it? I was never a huge fan of the Matrix movies. Let me know if it's any good. If it's out yet, I don't even know if it's out yet. But anyway, you know, they just start zipping around the damn basement, and Izo just like. You're just taking out his pistol, just pew, 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 pew. he's just trying to fire them. Meanwhile, they're striking him, they're hitting him with like Shiguns and all these advanced Roku Shiki moves. And like Izo has a moment where he's just pumped full of just like Shiguns and he's bleeding all over the place and he's broken bones and he's on the ground. I really hope if Oda's gonna do that, though, we have the whole chapter dedicated to it, and it's not a situation with Drake, where it's like, oh, Drake and Apu and the numbers are gonna face off against Cypher Pull Zero, and then we just cut away, and it's like, Zonki is down, Drake is down, and then freaking uh, Apu manages to get away once again, right? Please don't do that. I feel like with Izo's character, it's been such a good buildup behind the scenes that now we're finally getting to him being on center stage, and that works for him because he dances, right? That's his thing, right? And so it's like, the Izo takes center stage now. This is his moment. He deserves, I think, at least one chapter in Wano dedicated to him. The same way that, like, Killer had one, and, you know, Law and Kid have one now, and, you know, like, the Straw Hats. I, I feel like he deserves one, right? I also feel like Denjiro does as well, although Denjiro already had his chapters, but I deserve he deserves one more as well. But, like, Izo, can we get Izo at least one? So he's, like, completely beaten down, he's on the ground, and he's, like, on his knees, basically, just covered in blood and wounds, and Cypher Pole's just looming over him, and he's just like, you know, we've wasted too much time, you know? But may maybe Izo has some other maneuver, maybe he has, like, a super secret, like, shot that he can use with his pistol, or something, or he's like, I I'll, I'll channel all my hockey into this single shot, you know? And it's just like... Boom! It's like a hand cannon. Like, literally, a hand cannon. It, like, destroys the gun in the process. It just shatters apart, but it just, boom! Blasts this giant shot of hockey field rage at uh, Cypher Pole, and they just get hit by it, and it, like, maybe doesn't kill them, but, like, stalls them for enough time for, like, Robin and Brooke to escape the basement levels, or wherever they're gonna, they're gonna get away from, right? Okay? So, yeah. Can we get something like that with Izo? I feel for him. I really genuinely do. Um, um, so, and also there, we could have that flashback. We can have the flashback of the exact moment where Izo decided to stay on Whitebeard's crew, because that's something we still haven't explored yet, and I would love to see that moment. So, they arrive on that island where Roger and Whitebeard have their big clash, you know, where Roger takes Murakumo Giri, and um, you know, Roger takes out Ace, and they hockey it up, and they have that big epic clash moment right there, right? And they fight for like three days or whatever. And then after that, Roger and Whitebeard are kind of having a conversation about the Poneglyphs and Lodestar and everything. And he's just like, hey, uh, Whitebeard, lend me uh, Odin for one year so I can find this final island. And then so Odin left and Whitebeard was kind of upset by that. But I would love to see a scene where Odin looks to Izo during that moment and is like, Izo do you want to come along with me, right? Because Izo, you know, is the follower of Odin. You know, Odin is still the daimyo. Izo is still a member of the Scabbards. So it's like, I'm going to go to Roger's crew. I'm going to hop over there and help him out with some stuff. Do you want to come along with me? And there, there would have had to be a moment where Izo decided to stay with Whitebeard's crew rather than go with Odin, who is the daimyo that he pledged his allegiance to. That is a story. I'm not saying that, like, 
Izo is like, I'm sorry, Odin. I, I, I thought I respected you, but Whitebeard has that mustache. Have you seen that mustache? Odin's like, yeah, it is a pretty epic mustache, but Roger has a pretty epic stash too. And then Odin and Izo got into an argument over whose mustache is better. Whitebeard's mustache is better. Roger's mustache is better. And then they just left and just like, you know what? I don't even know you anymore. And then he just left. That would have been funny. But no, no, it would have been a very interesting moment where Izo might have decided, like, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this, where Izo would have not went with Odin, where Izo would have actually decided to go with a pirate instead of fulfilling his duty as a scabbard. You know, like, something really must have happened there. Maybe maybe there was a moment while Odin was still on the Whitebeard crew while they were traveling. Maybe there was a moment where Izo was about to get killed and Whitebeard saved his life. And that kind of opened up Izo's eyes, because he was he was living on Wano his entire life. The same with all the rest of the scabbards. He'd never seen the outside world, right? So maybe it was that moment, like, you know, exploring the world. Like, Odin loved that stuff. He, he loved to see the world. But Izo, it kind of opened his eyes as well. And he was like, this truly is remarkable. Like, you know, I can't believe I actually tried to stop Lord Odin from leaving Wano to see the outside world. The outside world is incredible. It's remarkable. So many sights to see, right? And uh, maybe there was a moment where his life was in danger and, and Whitebeard saved him. Maybe Izo just, like, he understood the dynamic of Whitebeard's crew, how they all call him, you know, like Whitebeard's like their father or like their big brother, you know, like it's like they're all one big family. Maybe Izo like respected that because his family dynamic, I mean, he has Okiku, his sister, um, but I think it was stated that their parents died very young, uh, you know, when, uh, when they were very young, like their parents were like dancers and stuff and they got, you know, killed. And so maybe Izo is like, well, you know, Odin isn't really much of a fatherly figure but Whitebeard definitely is, right? So it might have been a situation like that, and then when Odin decided to leave, also the idea, the implication was that, like, Odin was going to come back. That was kind of the idea, because it was the idea that, like, Roger only asked for Odin's services for one year. So the idea might have been, like, Izo's like, you know what? Um, Lord Odin, you go out to sea with Roger, you figure out what's at the end of the Grand Line, you find the Poneglyphs and all that kind of stuff. I'll stay here with Whitebeard on his crew. And in a year, you can come back to us, and then, you know, we can maybe go back to Wano together. Maybe it might have been something like that. Maybe Izo did not plan on staying on Whitebeard's crew indefinitely, right? Uh, he just didn't want to go with Roger for whatever reason. He just decided to stay with Whitebeard. So, uh, he was just loyal to him or whatever. And so then we all know what happened there after the Roger Pirates found the, uh, find... And so then we all know what happens after that. After the Roger Pirates found the One Piece, they disbanded, and instead of going back to Whitebeard's crew, uh, Odin decided to return to Wano as quickly as possible, right? Uh, for one thing, because, you know, um, Toki was there, uh, Toki and his children, so he probably wanted to see them again. And so he wanted to get back to uh, Wano to see the situation that was happening, because also, from what they found at Laugh Tale, it was like the prophecy involving Joy Boy and stuff. So they read that prophecy, or whatever it was, and Odin's like, holy shit, I need to get back to Wano immediately because I need to get back to Wano so I can prepare, so I can become the Shogun in my father's footsteps, and I can open up the country, and, you know, I can allow, you know, Joy Boy to return, right? So that's, like, his first priority, so it wasn't so much Whitebeard. So I gotta get back to Wano, and then he did, and then le that leads into everything involving Kaido, and Orochi, and, o and Odin doing the dances, and then eventually him being executed, and then by that point... Izo was still on Whitebeard's crew, and so he, d he never decided to go back to Wano because I guess it was too dangerous, and the whole situation with Toki's prophecy and the scabbards being separated and everything like that, I guess Izo decided the best thing to do was to stay on Whitebeard's ship until... 20 years went by until that prophecy was fulfilled, and that's what he did, okay? And in that 20 years, he rose to become the 16th Division Commander. By the way, I, I, I like to think that the 16th Division did not exist before Izo. I like to think that Whitebeard created the 16th Division purely for Izo. Maybe, like, after Odin left... They offered Izo the position of second division commander because, you know, they were both from Wano. And so Izo was like, actually, I don't want that position because that's Odin's position. I will refuse the second division position, you know. And so Whitebeard's like, oh, quit being so obstinate. Okay, fine. How about I just make a 16th division? Like there were only 15 up until then. It's like, I'll just make a 16th division and you can be the commander of that one then. And Izo's like, 
yeah, okay, that works. And he's like, all right, fine. Men, there are now 16 divisions. Boom. All right, cool. There you go. The white beard could have done that. That I actually like to think that that story makes a lot of sense there. Um, but yeah, so he wasn't there for Odin's death, and then, you know, he fought alongside Whitebeard and Marco and everybody for 20 years, and then we all know how that story ended, and then the payback war, they tried again, and they failed, so, oh my god, if, so if you factor in the payback war, we literally have Odin's death, then Ace and Whitebeard's death, and then the failure of trying to avenge Ace and Whitebeard's death to only be defeated again. So, we have four failures, four major failures that Izo, not, not like, they're not like, if Izo would have been there, it would have been drastically different. Like, if Izo would have been at the Hour of Legends, Odin would have still died. Izo fought as hard as he could at Marineford, there's nothing he could have done. Ace and Whitebeard would have still died. And I'm sure the Whitebeard pirates gave everything they had in the payback war, but Blackbeard was too strong, and so they still lost, you know? So it's nothing, like, on Izo, but he probably feels, like, that guilt that, like, that he could have done something and he just keeps failing or whatever, and that's the thing that probably eats him away. So he's like, you know, not this time. Not this time. If I'm going down, I, I might not even... It's the same kind of situation here, where, like I said, even if Izo was at full power, he probably could not defeat even a single masked member of Cypherpole. Uh, Cypher pull zero. They're just too strong, okay? But even if it's not going to do anything, even if it is going to just still result in his death, um, even if he's only going to manage to delay them for like 10 seconds and that's it, I like to think Izo could last a little longer than that, but he is severely injured right now, so keep that in mind. Uh, they should have given him the mink medicine. Hey, Miyagi, do you have any more of that medicine? <laughs> he just, he's like, oh, yeah, I have a bunch of it, but it's very, you have to be very careful with it. He's like, oh, whatever. Izo just takes the shot. Like, all right, let's go, Cypher Pole. You know, no, but he's like, he's severely injured. But even if he can only hold them back for a couple of minutes and it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, Izo would go ahead with it. Izo would try because he feels probably at this point that like death is the only way he can repay his debt to everybody that's, um, you know, taught him how to fight and, you know, uh, been loyal to him and everything like that. You know, Odin, Wipeard and all that stuff. Um, this is the best way that uh, Izo could really think to do it. So I hope everything works out for him. I hope he doesn't die. But uh, he kind of had a death flag in the last chapter. So we'll see uh, where Oda goes with that. But um, anyway, with that all being said, now we have Ella Fax. Here's the big one. The blockbuster elephant fact you've all been waiting for. Go grab your popcorn, ladies and gentlemen, because today we're talking about war elephants. That just sounds like a really cool, like, heavy metal band. You know, they do, like, 1980s style, kind of, like, heavy metal covers and stuff. It's just like, we are the war elephants! You know, okay. So, um, war elephants. Well, think about antiquity, ladies and gentlemen. Ancient warfare. Before gunpowder, before tanks, before stealth bombers, before uh, satellite laser cannons, before nuclear bombs or hydrogen bombs or any kind of bombs, we just had swords and spears and arrows and catapults and trebuchets, which that's a fun word to say, trebuchets, okay? All that kind of jazz. Uh, war was a little different, and I'll tell you what. War did not go to the people that had the most swords. The war did not go to the people that had the most men. No. War always went to the people that had the most fucking elephants. <laughs> so I want you to picture this. It's the year 500 BC, and you got your army of a bunch of people, but then the enemy army rocks up with like thousands of war elephants stomping through the battlefield, stabbing people. Like, quite literally, they had swords that would attach to the tusks of these elephants that would just gore people up and down the battlefield, stomping the crap out of them. I'll tell you what, up until the invention of gunpowder, War elephants were kind of the most devastating attack. They were the closest thing they had to nuclear weapons back in antiquity, right? It is like, all right, bring in the war elephants. Okay, so uh, to be part of the war elephantry, that was what it was called. War elephantry was the group that you'd be part of right there, okay? You obviously had to have some specific skills in taming elephants, you know, getting them to not, like, because that was the whole idea. You don't want them to stomp and kill your own men. You want them to stomp and kill the enemy men, all right? So you have to, like, train them in a specific way for warfare. Those poor elephants, by the way, they were just like, we're peaceful creatures, we don't wish to kill, but it's like, too bad, we're gonna add
add, like, swords to you and everything and just throw you into a battlefield, freak you out, make you stomp on the enemy. That's all you gotta do, right? So, um... I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly. I apologize. I'm probably going to butcher it. Chandragupta Moria. And I know Moria. I've, I've watched videos on how it's pronounced. And I think it is pronounced Moria. Or Moria. And um, he was stated to have in his employ over 9,000 war elephants, right? Um, you know, he was a ruler of India. He had like 600,000 infantry, you know, this many boats and everything like that. But then he had 9,000 war elephants. You don't want to piss that guy off, right? He's like, 9,000 war elephants ready to go. It's just like, holy crap, that's a lot of feed. Uh, actually, no, that is a legitimate concern because elephants tend, as we went over before in Elephant Facts, elephants tend to eat a lot. So if you're going to have 9,000 war elephants that, you know, when the battles aren't going on, they have to be fed, you know, they have to be fed. That's a lot of elephant shit right there. Um, but anyway, then we also have the story of Hannibal Barca, uh, the famous Carthaginian general, uh, you know, and if you've ever seen Drifters, you know about Hannibal Barca, but, you know, he actually famously led uh, a bunch of elephants to cross the Swiss Alps to invade Italy. Uh, and that was around 218 BC, crossing the Alps with a bunch of war elephants. Uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, which was Greek Egypt, they also utilized um, elephants. So most of the elephants that were utilized um, were Asian elephants, right? You know, so, so like India, for example, Chandran Gupta, obviously India. But when it came to Ptolemaic Egypt and Rome, they mo mostly utilized the northern African elephant. And so that elephant actually no longer exists because they were utilized for war elephantry so much, they actually were rendered extinct uh, just through over-exploitation, okay? And so the idea is they think that they're about the same size as the African forest elephant. It might have just been like a subspecies or whatever, but there was a species of elephant, the northern African elephant, that just doesn't exist anymore because of all the battles that were fought in antiquity with war elephants. And that was a surprising thing for me. Because considering how large elephants are, and I thought like, okay, managing to train so many of them for battle, I thought war elephants were something that only happened in very, very select moments in history. But no, they were they were way more prevalent in ancient times um, than I originally assumed, right? So yeah, um, and after the uh, the Punic Wars, which there were three of those, after the Roman Punic Wars, uh, they brought a bunch of elephants back to Rome and like to have in their empire, right? So it's like now we have you know the the nuclear deterrent. Back then they had the elephant deterrent, I guess. It's just like don't piss off Rome, don't piss off India. We have elephants. It's just like yeah, oh, well we can't do anything about that now, can we? Now. When gunpowder started becoming a thing, uh, not even, actually, honestly, not even so much guns, because the idea is elephants are so big, and they, and they have, the, their skin is very sensitive, but still, they're just so big, you fire at them, they were kind of able to shrug off, you know, uh, bullets. Also, keep in mind the kind of guns and firearms they were using back then, I mean, they could barely hit the broad side of an elephant, you know, and, you know, the accuracy was bad, took a long time to reload, and all that kind of jazz, and so even if they did manage to hit the elephant, they don't have nearly as much stopping power power as guns today do, right? So even with guns, they were still able to kind of have the advantage in battle, but then when cannons and stuff began to become a thing, you know, just like, oh, let's load a shit ton of gunpowder in this long cylindrical tube and then fire an iron ball. Yeah, that, that could take out an elephant in a single hit, you know, and even if it doesn't hit its, like, head or something like that, if it hits its side or its leg, you know, it's so much explosive power and, like, impact, it's gonna, like, knock the elephant, like, just knock the elephant over. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Attack on Titan a little bit, where, like, the Titans were used in Marleyan warfare for hundreds of years, thousands of years, but then, with the advent of increased technology and things, anti-Titan cannons and, like, you know, trains and stuff, and they're developing other technology against them, um, Titans are not as strong as they used to be. And so that's why war elephants aren't really utilized anymore. Um, although here is a picture of an elephant carrying some munitions during World War I. So that's a thing that was still used. I don't think elephants so much are used in warfare anymore because of like animal rights acts and stuff like that. Um, but I don't know, maybe they are in like some parts of the world. I have no idea. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's the idea of a war elephant. Um, they were utilized by a lot of complex societies way back in the day and probably absolutely terrifying to go up against them in battle if you didn't have any war elephants and the enemy did i mean just an intimidation factor alone like a giant not just one not just two but like 
hundreds of elephants are just stampeding towards you, and all you got is a damn sword. It'd be like, or some armor. It'd be like, shit, I'm dead, and just, like, run, you know? Like, what are you gonna do? It's like, yeah, intimidation alone would have been, you know, insane. Well, anyway, thanks for watching the video, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed. Teching and Barry, signing out.